We thank the Thomas family for that, and we uh, wish a happy Easter to those watching in Nigeria, because I guarantee you there are some people watching in Nigeria, their family and others, and so we welcome them to our worship as we worship together with people all over the world. We are grateful to see you. Two years ago, I preached in this room to Karen, not that she didn't need it, but she was standing right there. Uh, and uh, she was just filming me. That's all that was here. Uh, Mark was here and played some music, but it was just a few of us in this room. One year ago, uh, we uh, filmed the Easter service on Saturday and had a sunrise service out there early in the morning for a few folk who came up here, and this year we get to be together. Can we say an amen to that? Uh, yeah, we, uh, that's good. That's good. Uh, my old, old friend Jerry Buckner and mentor, he... He used to say this. He says, you never, you always know the first time you do something, but you don't always know the last. Truth, right? Now, that's not true about me and roller coasters. I don't remember the first time I rode a roller coaster, but I remember very well the last. Uh, <laughs> I was down in Dollywood with, uh, uh, my, uh, with Jacob and Joanna and Karen, and, and the kids wanted to ride a roller coaster, uh, and I didn't want to look like a wimp. You know, so I got on that thing, and it started flying around and jerking this way and careening this way and dropping this way. My neck hurt, and my stomach was nauseous, uh, and I was terrified. And as it was climbing up the last little plunge, I said to the Lord, Lord, if you get me off of this alive, I won't put either one of us through this ever again. And when I got down and got off of that cart, I made a vow that I would never again ride a roller coaster. And I have kept that vow to this day. I don't remember uh, much about the first sermon I ever preached on Easter. I was 20 years old. I was down in uh, Oklahoma in a little country church, white clabbered, uh, a little podium. I don't remember what I said at all, but I remember how I felt. It, it was nerve-wracking. I felt a thrill, uh, but I also felt a fear. A and I wasn't sure I could do it, and I gave it the best shot I, c I could, and I don't know if I did well or not, but, but I got through it. Uh, but if all goes as I have planned, and you never know, they, you know what they say about our plans and God, uh, but if all goes as I have planned, this will be the last Easter sermon I ever preach. I'm glad you're here. And it's made me think, what do I want to say this last chance to preach Easter? I I read something by a, a, a Methodist minister who was a missionary in India. His name was E. Stanley Jones, and he became very famous for what he wrote when he came back from India because he had so many encounters with God. But Dr. Jones says when he first started preaching Easter, he always felt like an attorney that had to prove the case of God to the jury. You would be the jury in this illustration. And that he argued the facts and he pled with the jury for a positive verdict that Jesus did raise, rise from the dead. But he said the longer he did that, he realized God doesn't need to be defended. And I can't prove the resurrection to anybody who doesn't believe it. So he said, I went and instead of becoming a lawyer, I just became a witness. Just a witness. And I just started on Easter giving a witness to what my experience has been with the risen Christ. So that's what I want to do today. I want to give you a witness of what my experience has been with the risen Christ. And I want to do that under the title of A View from the Other Side. When I began counseling... Bert and others who have done, and, and Susan and others who have sat in those rooms. Uh, I was uh, down in Louisiana, and, and people started calling me for marriage counseling. They were hard up, I guarantee you. <laughs> <laughs> and I always followed the same pattern. I, I would say, whoever called me, I'd meet with that partner first. It was usually the wife, by the way. And she'd come in, and I'd say, okay, well, let's hear about the problems. And she'd talk and talk and talk, tell me everything the guy had done and everything he'd said, everything he remembered, everything he'd forgotten, all of his behavior. And I, I would think, 
well, this guy's a monster. And, and it would be everything I could do to keep from just saying, run, run, get out of this marriage. But I was professional. I was faking. I was faking that I was professional. And so I sat there and said, well, I believe I need to meet with your husband. And then she would leave, and, and uh, a day or two later, the husband would come in, and he'd tell me everything she did, and everything she said, and everything she remembered, and everything she forgot. And I'd say, oh, maybe these two deserve each other after that. Sometimes you've got to get a view from the other side before you can get a full picture, amen? This is not a good Easter illustration. Some of you are going to have problems with this. Um, but I have this coffee table book filled with pictures of country music stars and artifacts. And my favorite picture in the whole book is Johnny Cash and June Carter Cash. If you don't know who these are, look them up when you get home. And they're standing there in front of a mountain. <laughs> it's a beautiful view. And John's got his arm around June, and June's got her arm around John, but they're very serious, extremely serious, very proper-looking people. But if you look closely, you can see in June's eyes, she's a little startled, a little startled. And then the photographer, you turn the page in the book, and you get the same pose from the other side, from behind the couple. And John's got his hand on June's posterior, and he's, <laughs> he's giving it a little squeeze. Hey, they're grown. They're married. Sometimes to get a full view of relationship, you need a view from the other side. We live on this side, don't we? We live here. And because we do, we are overwhelmed with so much negativity. We, we, we get angry about things that don't matter. You should be saying amen right now. We worry about things that never happen. We, we fear things that we don't have any control over any, anyway. Uh, we hold grudges and nurse them, and they don't lead to any healing at all. We condemn others while justifying ourselves. Then we turn around and condemn ourselves for being human. It goes on and on and on because we're locked in this, what I'm going to call this morning, the fray of life, where this web of negativity that holds us in here. And the only way we're ever going to get out of that is to get a view from the other side. From one who's not in the fray anymore, see, and can break us free. And that's what this story is about. Matthew says that the day after Sabbath, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to the tomb of Jesus. Now, I want to just take a quick aside here. Did you notice after the Sabbath? Did you read that? After the Sabbath. The Sabbath was the day God set aside for us to rest and worship. Now, the Hebrew folk, uh, the Jewish folks, they, they use the Sabbath on Saturday. Most Christians worship on Sunday. I don't know that the day matters, but there, God said you've got to have one day to rest. Can we get an amen for the rest? Y'all look like maybe some of you have started resting already. Uh, to rest and to worship and to worship, to reorient our view on the larger picture of life. We need to rest and worship. So Jesus dies on Friday. He's buried. I don't know of a single theological reason why he had to stay in the tomb on the Sabbath, except God said, I'm not breaking the Sabbath even for this. Now, if you think you don't have time for a day of rest, you got too much to do, too many important things to do to take a day of rest and worship, think back on this passage. You would think if there was any reason to break the Sabbath, it would have been to get Jesus out of that grave. But God said, no, not even for this. I'm not going to do that. We're going to take a break, and tomorrow I'll get him out of there. But today we're going to worship and rest. That's a freebie, that wasn't even in the text. But you got it anyway, and it's a secondary story back to the narrative. I just want you to rest, and I want you to find a way to worship. 
Mary and uh, the other Mary, who I believe was Jesus' mother, they went to the tomb, uh, and, and they're looking at things from our side. They're going to anoint a dead corpse. They're, they're grieving. They're in sorrow. They're enraged at what happened to the one they loved so fiercely. And when they get to the tomb, though, they find that the big stone in front of the tomb has been rolled away, and, and there is an angel sitting on the tombstone, dangling his legs over the side, and he says, yeah, y'all came to look for Jesus, but he's not here. He has been raised just as he said. If you don't believe me, go in and take a look around. And the two women go into the yawning cavern, and they look around, and there's no corpse. They get frightened. They come out, and the angel says, don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. Just go find uh, Jesus' disciples and tell them that he has risen and will meet them in Galilee. And so the women say, okay, and they go off on this mission, and they don't go very far, and they bump into Jesus, and Jesus looks at them and says, greetings, as if he bumped into them on Monday in the marketplace or something like that. Man, hey, how you doing? Uh, and they fall on the ground. They fall on the ground. They're worshiping him, and he says, no, 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 we got bigger fish to fry. Come on, come on, get up. Here we go. I want you to go. Don't be afraid, he says again. Don't be afraid. I want you to go on to Galilee. Tell my disciples I'm going to meet them there. And they do. They go on to Galilee. And they give these disciples that, that wonderful news. Because they need this news. They need to encounter Jesus as alive, the risen Christ now. I, I'm really interested in the fact that when the Apostle Paul says, there's one thing you've got to believe to be a Christian. Did you know that? Did you, did you know that's in the Bible? He says, there's only one thing you've got to believe to be a Christian. We add so many things, don't we? One thing. He said in Romans 10, 9, and 10, he said you've got to confess Jesus to be your Lord, but you've got to believe that, do you know the rest of it? That God raised Jesus from the dead. That's it. He doesn't say you've got to believe that the world was created in six days. He doesn't say you've got to believe in the virgin birth or the Holy Trinity. He doesn't say you've got to adopt the whole Apostles' Creed or, or all the doctrines of the church. He doesn't say you have to believe that Noah built an ark or that Joshua fit the battle of Jericho and the walls came tumbling down. You may believe all of that. Great. But Paul said the only thing you got to believe is that Jesus was raised from the dead. And I used to think that was because it was the greatest challenge of faith. You know, it's like, you know, if you're going to be a Christian, you got to go for the big one. you got to believe the biggest challenge of faith. Sort of like you got to get a 1600 on your SATs if you're going to Harvard. Many of you remember that happening for you. Uh, you got to do you got to knock the top out of faith if you're going to become a Christian, but I no longer believe that's what it means. I believe that in order for you and I to get through this world, we need to keep a view from the other side. And that only comes from our communion with the risen Christ, the living Christ, who tells us, who tells us, who helps us see we have to believe. If you believe Jesus is still in the grave, you got nobody to follow. We have no one to commune with. We have no risen Christ to speak to us. But if we believe that God has raised him from the dead, then we have one who walks with us, who talks to us, who helps us, who helps us get out of this fray uh, that we're all in. Boy, I'm stuck in it too. I, I, you know, I was thinking how negative I've been all my life. I haven't shown that to you. I've kept it very well hid. But um, I remember when I was a young father, and I would go buy Baskin Robbins. How many of you like the Baskin Robbins? Are you into that? Okay. You, you, yeah, okay. And I'd go buy Baskin Robbins. And that day, they, had, they used to have an apple pie flavor. It had chunks of apple pie in it. It was made in heaven. And, and I would go by there, and I'd think, oh, I'd like to get me one of those apple pie, ice cream cones, and then I'd look in my wallet and think, I can't do that. If I do that, I can't get baby food. If I do that, I can't get diapers. If I do that, ah, I don't have the money. I can't afford this, and I'd walk right on by. Now, I'm going to tell you something. I got a little cash in my pocket, <laughs> and I can afford the Baskin Robbins and keep the family in shoes, but now I walk by you know what I think. I think, oh, I'd love that ice cream, but I can't afford that ice cream. <laughs> I can't afford the calories. 
<laughs> so for 50 years, I haven't had any Baskin Robbins ice cream. There's something really wrong with that. Can't we get an amen to that? You get stuck in the fray, the negative stuff, and we hang on to the old grudges that just boil us up. We're not hurting the person we won't forgive. We're hurting ourselves. We're trapped in it. We can't let it go. And we fear about tomorrow and we, we fret about this and we rehearse old wounds and old mistakes. Uh, if you don't believe me, uh, you just think about what you've thought about over the last week. Think about what you've said in the last week. We all want to believe we're above the fray, don't we? Like everybody else is stuck, but we have been released. We're enlightened, you know. If, if, think of how many times you say these words. Did you see what she posted? <laughs> Do you believe what he said? That guy is nuts. <laughs> we want to believe that we're smarter and everybody else is dumb. That we're enlightened and everybody else is gullible. That our habits are moderate, necessary, and appropriate. But your habits are out of control, buddy. That's how we play the game. But brothers and sisters, we're all in the fray. We're all caught. We're all caught. And we need somebody to come get us and say, listen, there's another way of living. There's another way of looking. You're spending all your days here on earth in a negative vortex. And you're missing out on the beauty. You're not having any basket and Robin's ice cream. You're not having the joy. You're not having the freedom. You're not relaxed. You're not celebrating. You're not happy. You can get there if you just get the view from the other side. Richard Rohr wrote one of the most influential books in the last 20 years called The Universal Christ. And Rohr says if you read the New Testament, we find that the essence of Jesus, who he calls the Christ, that the Christ, John says, was with God before they ever came with him to Jesus, that the Christ, uh, Paul said, that the whole world was created through the Christ and that everything that is holds together in the Christ. And Richard Rohr says what they're talking about is the essence of God. They're talking about the purity, the, the pure love, the pure compassion, the pure goodness, the pure peace, hope joy that all of that is the Christ and that was put into human form in the uh, incarnation for 30 some years and Jesus walked this earth and taught us and then died and on Easter the Jesus was risen but the Christ went on to be with God in heaven and now Roar says anytime we encounter the spiritual power of pure love pure compassion pure joy pure goodness we are encountering the living Christ Right there with you today. Right there with you today. And when you pray, when I pray, we're, we're trying to get out of this fray, this uh, we're trying to get out of it, and we're saying, Lord, I'm worried about this and my bills and my kids and uh, my health. Uh, I, I, I'm worried about all of this. Uh, 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 Lord, can you help me? And the Lord is there to give us a view from the other side. It's going to be all right. I'm going to see you through. I'll be with you. Do not, what's the Easter message? Do not be afraid. Say that with me. Do not be afraid. Don't. I'm going to provide. I love your kids more than you do. Uh, I'm watching over them. Uh, yeah, they're messing up. They're going over Fool's Hill. <laughs> uh, but uh, I, I'm going to stay with them. Yeah, you got a sickness, but I'm going to be with you. And, and, and I will replenish your love and your joy and your peace and your patience. And when your days run out here, you're opening up a new chapter that goes on forever. And it'll be beautiful. It'll be joyful. It'll be happy. It'll be surrounded by love and compassion. It'll be better than you can even imagine. This is the view from the other side. Don't worry about death. Jesus says, I've been there. <laughs> I've come through it. And I'll bring you through it as well. I think it was Carl Jung, you have to ask Dr. Tom Rogerson, he knows all these things, you see. But uh, I think it was Carl Jung that first talked about the two halves of life. Was that, yeah, Tom says, yep, that's, see, I got that one right. Uh, but then there was a French philosopher that built on that. What, what Jung means is you spend the first half of life taking care of the details, you know, getting a job and maybe getting married or having some kids or paying the bills or getting an education. 
You all know all about that, don't you? Get it all, you know, nailed in there. But somewhere in the second half of life, wherever that begins for you, you quit worrying about all that, and, and you start opening your heart and your life more to the mystery and the mystical and the, the power of God. Some of you know this is true. You've experienced it, right? Can you say to me, yeah, okay, some of you are right, yeah. Uh, well, there was this French philosopher, Paul Ricoeur, and he built on that and says what you get Sometimes, if you're, if you're a person of faith and if you will trust Jesus' view from the other side, Paul Ricoeur says, you go into a second naivete. I don't know if that sounds good or bad to you. He says, you remember when you were a child and people said, God is love? Did you doubt that? No, you didn't. You just said, yeah, well, why wouldn't God love? And when God said, when you, don't worry, people are going to take care of you. As a little kid, you think, yeah, that's going to happen. Sure, sure. And, and uh, as my friend Chris Holmes always says, uh, everybody's an artist till the age of four. Everybody is. Everybody can sing till the age of about four or five. And then somebody starts telling them, you can't sing. You can't draw. You can't dance. And they lose that naivete. And then we move into adolescence. Oh, I'm starting to shake just thinking about it. You get into that critical thinking. You know what that is? Where you just see the flaws in everything. And you think you're the first one who ever did. Dad's a hypocrite. <laughs> Mom, you can't trust her. The man. <laughs> the government. We, just, we get it all down real quick, don't we? But about 17, we know everything there is to know. And, and so we got it all figured out, and we got this critical thinking, and then we start turning it to theology. I can't believe in a God when there's suffering in the world. And that's critical thinking right where you're supposed to be. Move on, move on, move on. But Record says somewhere, if we are fortunate and keep faithful, we open our heart and the uh, view from the other side, the living Christ, pure goodness and love and compassion and hope and peace comes into us and we develop this second naivety where we say, I can't explain all this to anybody, but, but I just know there's a loving God even though there's the Ukraine. I, I don't know, I, I just believe. And I believe that even in spite of everything I see on Good Friday, there's going to be a better day on Sunday. And I just believe now that somehow... Everything's going to be okay. We're going to end. The ending word is going to be love and peace and patience and forgiveness and joy. And I'm going to live with that view from the other side. When I was uh, about 28, I think, I got invited to preach at Ridgecrest, North Carolina. Now, for you non-Southern Baptists, that doesn't mean anything to you. For the rest of you, that was a big deal. Now, I'm going to be honest with you because you might Google it. Um, <laughs> I wasn't invited to be the keynote, the big-time preacher in the evening. I was invited to preach in the morning. I and mean, everybody's kind of groggy and they don't show up anyway. But, but still, it was a big deal. And I remember a morning that I was worried about the sermon. And I went for a walk early in the morning. And I came to this railing. It was a, uh, one of these three pole rails. I don't know, you, you've seen a million of them. They, they're metal, I believe, and painted. And there's usually one, two, three. It's a barrier to help you. And I went up there and I looked over the barrier. And there was like a 30-foot drop down to a loading deck down below. It was on the back of the cafeteria where the trucks would pull in and unload. And so I looked down there and think, well, that's not good. So I, I thought, well, I was still immersed in this sermon. I was thinking about it. And I got up on that railing and sat on it. And it was wet. And I had on some kind of slick pants. I was slick back in those days. <laughs> and I started sliding. I started sliding. <laughs> yeah, I'm not kidding you. I slid. And I went so fast I lost control and I flipped over the railing. And it was like a Roadrunner cartoon. I grabbed that first rung and my hand slipped off. Boof. I grabbed the second rung and my hands gave way. I grabbed the third rung and I held on, praise Jesus. And I was hanging on there dangling. And I started saying, help me, help me. <laughs> and I heard a voice said, let go. I said, let go, I'll break my neck. He said, trust me, let go. I didn't have any choice. I never have been strong. I couldn't pull myself up. I couldn't do one pull up. 
So I said, well, here we go. And I let go. And I fell about seven inches to a ledge. (laughs) I hadn't noticed that there was a two-foot ledge that they had built right on the other side of the railing, probably to protect idiots like me from falling to their death. And I looked down, and there was like a 10-year-old boy. (laughs) I was terrified. And I needed a view from the other side. We got it. We got it on this day, Easter. You got the view. You might remember that Esther Schreiner's daughter died two weeks ago, and she was in grief. I went to see her soon after that. Esther was our oldest member, 100 years old. And I sat by Esther, and we talked. And Esther never had a problem saying what was on her mind. Never in the history of her life did she have a problem. She'd just tell you, I don't like that tie. Uh, she'd say, you need to do something with your hair. Whatever it was, she just gave me this advice. (laughs) And so I went to see her, and we were talking, and she said, I am so angry. I said, okay. What about? She said, I prayed with all the power I had that God would take me first and leave my daughter, let me die before my daughter. And I heard that, and I, I did the right thing, chaplain. I didn't just rush on. But then I came back, and I said, you know, in a way, Esther, your prayer was answered. God was merciful. He let Donna go onto her home before you to get all that. And now she's going to be there at the gate to welcome you. And Esther said, I believe you're right. It was a view from the other side. Christ is risen. Christ is risen indeed. Walk in faith and goodness. You're in the hands of an eternal Christ that will carry you every step of the way. I want to leave you with this. I really think my faith in Christ, I think I will need it the least on my dying day. I think that's the least day I'll ever need it. I think it's going to be the easiest thing I ever do. Let go go on into the grand eternal. (laughs) But every day till then, I'm going to need the view from the other side. And the living Christ will guide us all. Amen.